Okay, um, I've got a little handout going around just so I could give a handout, but it's not that amazing of a handout, but hopefully it'll give you something to look at as well as a PowerPoint, which we got working. I think from the session that we just had, um, it's going to be really interesting for me to now be delivering this. So this paper might be a bit different than what you're all used to, um, because I work across sociology and philosophy. So um, I do empirical research and then kind of apply a phenomenological analysis, mostly informed by the work of Simone de Beauvoir. Um, and specifically, I look at our conceptual frameworks around violence against women and girls. So normally I'm presenting to an audience that's very well versed in violence against women and girls, um, who are less knowledgeable in the work of existentialism or knowledge of phenomenology, um, though they do generally have some sense of Beauvoir because of her place on um, a women's studies curriculum. But today I'm presenting, obviously, to a room full of philosophers, so this is an exciting and terrifying <laughs> prospect. Um, so I'm very thankful to the organisers for accepting my paper here. Um, as I'm finding, kind of, despite the rhetoric that I'm definitely getting pushed into around this interdisciplinary working, it can mean that actually your work never quite finds a home. You're never really speaking to an audience who understands both sides of what you're saying. Um, and my home's in violence against women and in existentialism. And despite the theoretical resonance, it's hard to straddle the two. So today I'm going to try, um, and it will be very interesting to hear your comments afterwards. So I'm going to do a number of things. Um, I want first to give a brief overview of one of the core conceptual frames in violence against women, which you may know or may not know, uh, which is Liz Kelly's Continuum of Sexual Violence. I then want to outline my understanding of Beauvoir's analysis of the role of adolescence mostly, but also early girlhood, in how women is taught to assume her condition. And then I'm going to walk you through some of the findings from my empirical research, uh, which was conducted with 50 women, mostly living in the UK, around their experience as girls and teenagers of intrusion from unknown men in public. So that's some of the practices often grouped under the heading of street harassment. What was that? Like wolf whistling sexual comments, calls to cheer up, which happen a lot in, in England. Um, but also, <laughs> in, in terms of that, just quickly, it's why I was so interested in the stuff around the expressive body, because cheer up for the women um, was one of the things that they found the most difficult to deal with. And I it's wonder if it's... It's these bits around the end. Yes. Go <laughs> <laughs> down. And then as soon as it's gone down, people spend their life to cheer up. But I wonder if it's something about not being recognised in terms of that expressive body, having that body misrecognised or something. Um, but also, the way that I framed it, not just looking at street harassment, because it's about male intrusion, it includes forms of sexual assault, rape, um, practices such as stalking or physical assault. So just, I guess, to flag at the start that some of what I might be saying, I'm going to use the words of my participants because I think that's important, um, might be unusual for a philosophy conference and it might be a bit hard to hear. So if anyone needs to talk to me afterwards or anything like that, please do. Um, I also want to say from the outset, uh, again really important given the papers that we had this morning, that I looked at the experience that women had um, of intrusion from men. So I can only speak about that particular dynamic with the recognition that other dynamics play out across um, forms of public space harassment, particularly racialised harassment. Uh, my sample did have a wide age range, so it was 18 to 63 years. Um, interesting stuff around age came up. Uh, but it was more limited in ethnicity, so just under three quarters identified as being from some form of white background, um, and also limited in terms of sexuality, with again close to three quarters identifying as heterosexual or straight. So though I can say some things here to help conceptualise what might be going on, there are some things that my research never got to, and I wouldn't want to claim that it had. So a crucial one really is the experience of racialised forms of sexual harassment um, that black and minority ethnic women experience in public space. Um, given that I'm talking to a philosophy audience, um, and particularly people who are interested in Sartre and existentialism, um, I wouldn't expect you to try and essentialise anyway from the commonalities of the singular lived experience that I'm going to talk about. So my aim is to pull together the two, the empirical work and the conceptual, to talk about how the routineness with which women experience men's intrusion in childhood and adolescence, and the messages that they learn about the cause of such intrusion as being located in the body, can be understood through Beauvoir, and also Merleau-Ponty, who I used, um, as resulting in a particular modality of female embodiment marked by alienation. Um, and that's alienation from both the body, which becomes this inert given object rather than an expression of the self, and also an alienation from the world. Um, as many of you will know, and, and as we were just talking about, um, for Beauvoir, the body is not a thing, it's a situation, it's the grasp upon the world, um, the world is our world, and it's the sketch of our projects. 
The experience of a continuum of men's intrusive practices across the life course, however, encourages women to live their bodies as a thing, separate from the self, a passive, inert thing that's acted on but not acted through, um, which fits into the discussion we were just having around submission. My central contention in this paper is that in order to protect her humanity, women adopt a mode of alienation to this passive thing-like body, experiencing themselves as separate from their body and experiencing their body as not theirs. Um, so to begin, uh, it's around the continuum of men's intrusive practices. So everyday practices and the lived experience of women are at the heart of the continuum of sexual violence, which is a phenomenological frame for understanding men's violence against women. One of the key discoveries in Liz Kelly's Surviving Sexual Violence, which was written in 1988, was the extent and range of the forms of sexual violence participants had experienced, leading to Kelly conceptualising their experiences as located across a continuum. Such a theorisation at the time marked a shift in thinking, from a focus on individual manifestations of men's violence against women as discrete categories, um, to recognition of the commonality and connections between different forms. To do this, Kelly drew on the dual meanings of the term continuum to replicate the complexity of the relationships women have to experiences of sexual violence, both those they have experienced themselves and those that have been experienced by other women. So kind of key here is the fact that her conceptualisation marked a shift in that it's not about hierarchy. So this hierarchical positioning, which is very common for people who are not kind of in violence against women field, where, for example, rape is seen as the worst thing that could possibly happen to a woman... Um, and uh, calls to cheer up on the street are framed as just a minor annoyance that you need to just get used to. Um, that kind of framing risks losing how the quieter forms of her intrusion, so those cheer up and wolf whistles, um, those that are experienced by women as a restriction in freedom rather than uh, uh, safety or, or danger, they rely on the possibilities and realities of the louder criminal forms to have the particular impact that they do. So with the key exception of violence that results in death, she holds that the degree of impact cannot be simplistically inferred from the form a woman experiences or its place within the continuum. The continuum of sexual violence, instead, is about the lived experience of sexual violence and the ways in which it connects contextually to particular meanings for individual women. So a simple and quite current example here, um, that I'm sure you've all seen in the news gaining recognition, is the levels of online abuse that are being experienced by women. Um, something which is really starting to gain recognition for being qualitatively different than the types of abuse that are being directed to men. Um, and that difference is based on its reliance of threats of physical violence and sexual harm. Uh, I would argue that to threaten a woman online with rape has a different feeling for the receiver who's lived a life where rape is inscribed in her field of possibilities. Um, so much so that its absence becomes a fortunate lack. So for the women that I spoke to, and I'm sure you've all heard this, um, a recurrent theme was I'm lucky I haven't been raped so instead of being an unexpected or unfortunate addition to her field of possibilities it was a lack, an absence um, a rape threat draws online draws its particular meaning and impact from the prevalence of rape as a reality and a possibility in women's everyday lives this position resonates with one of the core tenets of the existential phenomenological tradition drawn on both by Simone de Beauvoir namely that phenomena have meaning and they're being meaningful to someone Subjective meaning is made through relation, relating instances of violence to each other and the wider social context in which we operate, um, and also to the ways in which we understand our possibilities and enact our projects. Examining the experience of men's intrusion in detail unearths the interdependency of individual practices and problematises their separation into clear and concise categories. This connects to Merleau-Ponty's development of Husserl's concept of horizons, whereby all experience is understood as horizontal, linked internally to all other experiences. Um, and also to the continuum of sexual violence. So Kelly's conceptualisation demonstrated how the splitting of men's intrusive practice, practices into the distinct groupings, often necessary for analysis um, and definitely used in criminal framings, can disrupt attempts to reflect the meaning such practices have in individual lives. For Beauvoir, the splitting matters as, and I quote, is within the context of a situation that leaves her few outlets that these singularities take on their importance, end quote. However, there's a tension here. So there's a desire to collate similarities, but that struggles to sit alongside holding both the ambiguity of and the particularities between or within different experiences of men's intrusion. Um, building on the work of Kelly and others, critical masculinities theorists Malcolm Cowburn and Keith Pringle 
suggests that the ways in which different patriarchal processes generate and are generated by what they term men's oppressive practices intersect with each other in a series of social locations. Um, and I quote here, to the extent that any one of those locations can only be fully appreciated when it is seen in the context of the others. End quote. The importance of understanding men's intrusive practices in relation to each other is thus a key part of any attempt to understand the way that they operate and the place that they occupy in women's lives. Kelly's work can thus be drawn together with Beauvoir to begin sketching an outline for a feminist phenomenological approach to violence against women and girls. Such a task is much wider than my project today, um, but hopefully this paper will give a sense of how I see that project developing. And it starts in Beauvoir's gender development of Merleau-Ponty's work on the body. So, as we've touched on all through today, really, Beauvoir begins her analysis of women's lived experience in the second volume of The Second Sex by detailing the formative years of a woman's life from childhood through sexual initiation and adulthood. The impacts of experiencing the continuum of men's intrusive practices are actually acknowledged during these sections. So, in Chapter 2, for example, Beauvoir states, If they wander the streets, they are stared at, accosted. I know some girls, far from shy, who get no enjoyment strolling through Paris alone because, incessantly bothered, they are incessantly on their guard. All their pleasure is ruined. Despite this acknowledgement, Beauvoir actually spends little time unpicking men's practices in relation to women's situation. Such an absence is particularly notable given Beauvoir's recognition of men's role in casting women as the inessential other, and also in her explicit recognition, as given above, of the impact of the experience of men's intrusion on women's emerging sense of a bodily self. Adolescence, however, is singled out as having a particular place in the establishment of women's situation. An awareness of our body image, for example, is key in what for Beauvoir signifies part of the transition from childhood, that is, what she terms the girl becoming aware of her body. To investigate how the experience of men's intrusion is a constitutive part of women's situation, then, we need to examine these early experiences. So our question here is, what are the consequences of men's intrusive practices for women's developing sense of a bodily self? Um, Borrowing from Merleau-Ponty, we can ask what forms of bodily know-how emerge and the habit body. What form of habit body um, do women begin to develop? So... I'm going to move on to some of my findings around that. Um, 80% of the women who participated in my research, which was a a lengthy process, um, we had face-to-face conversations, and then I got them to keep a notebook um, from between uh, two weeks to two months, recording all the instances of intrusion that they experienced, and then we had a final um, follow-up conversation. So 80% of the women who participated in that explicitly recalled experiencing some form of intrusion from an unknown man in public before the age of 18. And what was quite interesting was the majority of these were able to clearly remember the entire context of those encounters. That was very different than what started to happen as they were older. When they were talking about experiences that they'd had even the week before, it was more difficult to understand the entire context. So there was something about what was happening in childhood and adolescence that was standing out and, and staying in their memory. For many of these, um, the early experiences had a particular impact in that, um, as stated by Theodora, one of my participants, um, she says, and I quote, quite a lot of the time it's the first time you've ever seen a penis or it's the first time you've ever been groped. Uh, Sophie and Jocena, both in the context of teenage or pre-teen experiences of men's public masturbation, describe such an impact. So I'm going to show these up here. I'm not going to read them aloud. I'm just going to let you um, have a read because then I can drink some more. And then Jocena, very similar. So the lived experience for participants of these intrusive men marked a particular point in women's development where the social meanings of sexual difference become embodied. Beauvoir describes the ways in which, and I quote, for girls and boys, the body is first the radiation of a subjectivity, the instrument that beams brings about the comprehension of the world. They apprehend the universe through their eyes and hands and not through their sexual parts. The experience of men's stranger intrusions for participants in my research marked a point whereby the body moved from being experienced as this radiation of a subjectivity, wholly ours and wholly us, 
to the experience of having a body, Beauvoir's body object. This is particularly evident in an account um, from Janine of being whistled at as a 13-year-old on her paper route. Uh, she says, it's the first time I think you realise I'm not a guy and men have one up on you. So for Janine, it's not just that she experiences her embodiment as a body object through men's intrusion, but that it's experienced as a female body object. Here, women's situation under patriarchy begins to enter into the lived experience of our embodiment, an ambiguous entanglement that's difficult to capture through the dualism of biological sex and social gender. Identifying men's intrusion as grounded in her femaleness, Janine, like many other participants, turned to the women around her to check their understandings. The message that she received here from her mum was common across women's accounts, that of men's intrusion as being ordinary. B recalls a similar response from her mother. She says, and I quote, I remember as a kid men whistling at me and stuff, and my mum just laughed it off and said, he's a stupid man. Both mothers here are referring to the mundanity of men's intrusion in women's lives. Such reactions, however, play a key role in what is for Beauvoir, how women is taught to assume her condition, how she experiences this, what universe she finds herself enclosed in, and crucially, what escape mechanisms are permitted her. The lesson here is that part of the situation of a woman's body is that this body can be acted on by men, that men's intrusion is embedded, embedded in women's embodiment. Um, drawing from Van's Famine, we're talking about this morning, um, it's not so much internalised as epidermalised, it's written in the body. Similar messages are also seen in an account from Jacqueline, um, who really crystallised what my other participants were talking about in this phrase, it's all part of growing up. This generational knowledge passed down from women to girls, um, or also from men to boys in different contexts, it's conceptualised by one of my colleagues, Maria Garner, as a gendered heritage, resonant with Beauvoir's claim that women are heirs to a weighty past. For both Jacqueline and Janine, this inherited mode of being in the world includes the continuum of men's intrusive practices as ordinary and women's bodies as its source. Even in accounts of intrusion before adolescence, participants spoke of learning that men's intrusion is part of the living experience of being a woman, either explicitly from adult women who told them to ignore or implicitly from the lack of response to people witnessing what was happening. Um, a particularly powerful example of this comes from Kathy. Uh, she recalled an experience of being sexually abused as a nine-year-old girl on a public bus by an unknown man. So I will read out her quote, because it's quite powerful. Um, Travelling on a long bus journey, Kathy and her 13-year-old brother both wanted window seats, as you do when you're a kid. So what we did was we sat at the back of the bus... And pretty soon, after we set off, this man came on the bus and sat next to me. And he molested me, on the bus, on the back seat. And my feeling about it is that, for me now, I'm almost not even sure it happened or what happened, but the fear was so huge. And afterwards, when we got there, it wasn't like, oh, we got there. It was, my brother didn't help me, and everyone on the bus didn't help me. They just ignored it. On the bus, they didn't even turn around. At one point, I began to weep, and nothing happened. These early lessons have particular importance given that practices of intrusion were rarely experienced solely as episodic for participants, but that, as I mentioned in the beginning, over time they became experienced in relation to each other, so a model of continuous, cumulative living reality. Here the connections between episodes of intrusion operate on another layer. Not only are they experienced in relation to each other, but they're also lived as irrevocably enmeshed in the body. In this way, the episodic becomes embodied. Such a framing is embedded in Beauvoir's concept of situation, the total context grounding our freedom and agency and that through which and in which we understand the world and ourselves. In the words of Beauvoir, what is happening here is that the meaning given to these practices, and I quote, settles into her body. It becomes the most concrete reality. This is part of the meaning behind Beauvoir's claim that the body forms a situation itself. To understand the impacts of this on how women enacted their embodied selfhood, it helps to further examine participants' early experience of intrusion, both before and during their adolescence. So, just looking at childhood now, um, just over a third, 36% of my participants, recalled explicitly an experience of intrusion at 12 years old or younger. Um, 
four of those recounted experiences of intrusion from known men, um, which makes sense because, you know, as a child, 12 years old and younger, it's not very often that you're around unknown men. Um, in the second sex, Beauvoir describes what she terms as the puberty crisis, being a key point in the development of our lived body. Uh, here, I would argue Beauvoir is not making a biological or essentialist argument, as she's somehow um, sometimes claimed to be doing so. Rather, it's the situation, both the socio-historical and the material, that evokes this crisis. Many participants in their earliest accounts of men's intrusion express the ambiguity that Beauvoir finds tied to the developing female body, where her body be begins to be experienced as both a vehicle for her freedom and a source of its oppression, as a feeling of bewilderment. Um, and we can really see this in an account from Claire here. Claire's confusion here is reminiscent of women's experiences of men's public masturbation before having seen a penis. These early intrusions occur before women, then girls, had developed experiential knowledge of men's intrusive practices as connected. Um, I found it useful to, to think about, and I've fully thought about it to the point that I wanted to get it to, but around Heidegger's, Heidegger's concept of thrownness here, um, about being thrown without knowledge or choice into a world where we're already living in a particular situation. So thrown into a situation where our lived body, which was initially experienced as ourselves acting through, is now experienced, as being, experienced from the outside as being acted on and acting through by men, our embodiment becomes to be experienced as a site of tension or anxiety. The body becomes unsafe. Um, Beauvoir describes this quite well as um, our body beginning to escape us. And so again, we see that she's actually talking about intrusion. Um, yeah. This of the desire for invisibility that she talks about, though it does mark the experience of many of my, of my participants as they grew older and was present in part in childhood, was really complicated in adolescence, where many spoke of experiencing a sense of themselves as acting on men and thus an assertion of themselves who is causing the men to intrude. So almost two-thirds of participants described explicitly experiences of intrusion during adolescence. Some participants reconciled the confusion common in those childhood and preteen accounts during this period through employing a dominant narrative of men's intrusion as complementary. Uh, it's really well described by Becky. So this reconciliation, even where it conflicted with women's experiential reality, allowed for a feeling of re reclamation in respect to an agency um, situated in their female embodiment. Marley was not alone in describing how she experienced an embodied capacity through evoking a reaction from men based on her appearance. So the mode of embodiment enacted here is one whereby the capacity of the bodily self is lived through the body image and an agency is expressed in taking up one's own body as an object. This agency is not expressed by the body as being the self in action, acting on others and the world, but rather through a mode of embodiment where the body is distanced from the self and lived as a body object to be acted on. The body image becomes that through which women live their abilities of the bodily self. Um, something I was thinking through as, as a modality of embodiment marked by using one's body rather than being one's body. And such a framing really connects to Beauvoir's descriptions of how women learn to resign themselves to this position of inessential other. So again, very connected to what we were talking about earlier. Um, what I really want to pull on here, though, and um, what I really found was this kind of key phrase, with some resistance, that underlies the difficulties in claiming such agency is the expression of an ontological freedom. There is an agency here, but it's a situated agency, expressed within the whole context of a situation, 
um, which generally comes from those early preteen experiences of intrusion. The situation is marked by tension, diminishing women's subjectivity alongside this ambiguous holding together, alongside experiencing female embodiment as being the source of men's intrusion. So a dilemma exists then between living one's embodiment as a body subject, where that body and thus the self is a site of discomfort and unsafety, um, or enacting a mode of embodiment whereby the body is taken up as a body object. So for participants such as Marley, a sense of self was asserted through adopting this latter modality of embodiment, performing the practices of femininity and understanding men's intrusion to be a result of this. Such a framework, however, can be disrupted through the continued contradiction between the narrative of men's intrusion as complementary and particular experiences of intrusion. Abby describes this really well. And this definitely came up with a lot of other participants. There was, there was a breaking point where having framed this as being about something about the way that you look and some kind of positive evaluation, they would have an experience where either it was very, very scary or it didn't seem to match what they thought their, their appearance was. So the ensuing disorientation where men's intrusion is experienced as complementary but not connected to a positive self-evaluation is also found where intrusion had been experienced as frightening but is framed by others as apparently ordinary. Uncovering such contradictions occurred for many participants during adolescence. Beck, for example, was 16 years old when a taxi driver asked her to exchange sex for her cab fare. Uh, she managed to force him to stop the car and got him to leave him on the si- her on the side of the road, after which she, time she flagged down another cab and she made her home. She didn't tell her parents because she felt like she'd done something wrong, but she did speak to a neighbour um, who validated the fact that something wrong had been done to her and told her to go to the police. So Beck then reported the intrusion to the police, who unfortunately um, kind of dismissed what had happened as something she just needs to be prepared for. So for Beck... Having made sense of the intrusion as her fault, she receives validation that it's criminal, only to have the police reframe it as ordinary. So the confusion between what is ordinary, what is complementary, and what is dangerous was further complicated for many participants and adolescents through experiencing the escalation of intrusion. So returning to Marley, who before was saying this felt great, this felt like an awakening of being responded to as a sexual being, being um, This escalation starts to jostle against these previous feelings of an embodied agency and how her body caused men to intrude. So here, enacting an embodiment which distances the body from the self is reified in the discovery that this ambiguously alienated body, ours but also not us, is now not even our own to act on. This is also seen in Hannah's account of the first intrusion she can remember. Walking home from school as a teenager, she had a car with two 20-year-old men pull alongside her and ask for directions. Uh, The man in the passenger seat first told her she was pretty, and then this happened. So Hannah's account and her confusion supports Beauvoir's claim of the female body as a site of ambiguity. This man's initial statement of Hannah being pretty is understood as arising from how she's acted on her body, something within her control and expression of her freedom. Following this, his rapid escalation to asking for oral sex leads to a feeling of humiliation through the contradictory discovery for Hannah that she's not in control of when, how, and crucially how much men will act on her body. So her female embodiment becomes to be experienced as both the source of her freedom and the source of its constraint. In an attempt to reclaim a sense of control over this alienated body, women spoke of beginning during their adolescence to develop strategies for being in the world that would limit men's intrusion. Key here is that for most participants, this was not marked by embodied practices that expanded out into the world, but rather through restriction. In describing their early experiences, most participants acknowledged a conscious 
adaption of behaviour, movement and bodily posture. Delilah's first experience illustrates the ways in which intrusions combine. Um, it was so long I can't even really get it on slide, so I didn't. Um, but it moved through a verbal intrusion which happened on a bus, um, through to the man getting off the bus and following her, and how the idea that nothing really happens actually hides the way in which the unremarkable something that did happen was a change to the way that she experienced the freedom and capacity of her bodily self. So she then says after this experience... The account that she gave me was, as I said, very long. She could remember it um, very, very clearly, even though it had happened, I think, about eight or ten years ago. Um, she was followed off a bus at 16 on her way home from an exercise class. She had to alter her route a number of times to try and lose him. Um, and eventually she stopped outside a busy hospital and she said to the man, if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to scream. Um, but for Delilah, this experience resulted in her limiting her freedom. She stopped doing what she was she wanted to do. Um, recounting that experience in a criminal framework, for example, nothing actually happened. Um, similarly for Caroline, the first experiences of men's stranger intrusion that she could remember resulted in this explicit adaptation of her behaviour. Adaptations that, like for Delilah, decreased her space for action through restricting her freedom of movement. Okay, so for many participants, however, it's not just their behaviour that was restricted to enact a sense of safety but the way that they lived their embodiment. So no longer was the body lived through as an ex authentic expression of the self, being our living body, nor was the world lived as an open field for our intentions, our being in the world, rather an embodiment as an actor where both the body and the world were held at a distance, habitually acted on, restricted and adjusted in order to create a sense of safety. Such safety work, repeated over time, becomes habitual and through this a form of hidden labour absorbed into the body. These habitualised modes of embodiment are marked by what Iris, Iris Marion Young terms inhibited in intentionality and a strategic alienation from rather than an enmeshment in body and world. So as one of my participants told me, don't be in your body, watch your body. The body is not lived as the self. Instead, the self is experienced as distinct from and yet tied to the body, a body that is that ambiguous, both is and is not herself. The body, in terms of being our lived body, is still ours in terms of being singled out. Um, but it's not lived as the original focus of our intentionality. It's not lived as being us. The experience of men's intrusion is both a recognition of our subjectivity. Um, there is, after all, no point objectifying a box or a suitcase. Um, an object cannot be made aware of its thingness. At the same time as being a depletion of it, what Deborah Turkheimer describes as a curious paradox of being both an object and a subject. Applying a Beauvoirian framework to the operations of alienation in this context thus allows for the ambiguity and the contradictions of women's lived experience here, the experience of the body as both the self and not the self, and extending into our relationship in the, to the environment. So this was again um, given by one of my participants in this kind of beautiful phrase, which was, you need to find a version of the world you can live in, you can be in. Um, and that reminded me of Sarch, and because it's Sarch Society, I thought I'd throw this in there and see what happens. <laughs> um, so there's an example that he gives of bad, bad faith that you'll all be familiar with, um, but that I want to talk about maybe reconfiguring um, as this idea of alienation as strategy. So in Being in Nothing as Such gives two famous examples of bad faith, um, an example for men's bad faith about a young man playing at being a waiter, and really interestingly, I think, an example for women giving in relation to the practices of men. So... I'll just recount it. Um, Such watches a young woman on her first date, attempting to avoid a man's advances. He holds her hands in his, and the woman leaves her hand there, neither consenting nor resisting, apparently without noticing. Um, <laughs> Such reviews this as the woman's attempt to flee from her freedom, alienating her body, and through this delaying the moment where she must choose to either acknowledge and reject his advances or accept them. So a fleeing from her freedom. Um, using this study as the point of departure, what in Sartre is an act of bad faith can, could, maybe be re reconceptualised as an expression of the woman's situated freedom. So Sartre may be, we don't know, describing a moment experienced by the young woman as being intrusive. Um, it is not by chance that she's all intellect at this point. Alienating the body may be a purposeful act. 
Caught by the need to not escalate the man's behaviour by either encouraging or challenging what he's doing, what Versace is seen as consenting or resisting, um, but also being unable to physically remove the bodily self. The young woman protects herself by enacting a mode of embodiment whereby she lives, and this is his words, herself as not being her own body. This act of bad faith becomes a type of resistance and an assertion of the self, habitualising a particular relationship to her embodiment where the body is held at a distance as a way to resolve the paradox of living the bodily self as subject and object in a context of men's intrusion as ordinary. And so it's with that notion of resistance that I want to conclude, because habitually enacting this mode of embodiment whereby the body and world is alienated does have, I definitely found for my participants, um, a self-protective element in that the individual experiences or encounters with intrusion no longer have the force that they had in girlhood where women first experienced that transition from the body, self and world as interdependent to experiencing the body as separate and a vulnerable object situated in rather than of the world. In a situation that leaves her few outlets, a woman takes her permitted escape. Experiencing the transition not as forced but as an assertion of agency, alienating the body and the environment through an act of will, and through this she finds a sense of embodied selfhood which was diminished through men's intrusion. Thank you.